Hey everybody! Uh, so I'm splitting our video for this week into uh, two videos so that they'll be a little more manageable in size. Um, it's a history of interdisciplinary studies uh, that starts from, uh, I guess, the beginning of thinking about studying and universities uh, up through uh, more recent times, um, which will be the second video. So we'll have the old one and we'll have the new one. And I also have uh, links that I'm going to post for um, little crash courses in the history of ideas. Uh, the crash course series of videos are these kind of fun, super fast, 10 minute videos where you can go through and learn about a variety of topics. Um, in a class like this one, they're valuable because they give you a lot of information in a fairly short amount of time. And they're also kind of fun and have little animations in them. So even if there might be a thing or two that you disagree with in there, um, for example, some of the English lit ones, I'll be like, well, that didn't really happen like that. It's still not bad because it gives people an overview and the overview is what we're looking for here. Um, so we're going to, uh, the first three uh, bullet points are the ones that this video will cover and we'll get started. All right, um, so trying to figure out where interdisciplinarity comes from is a little bit tricky because before we had uh, academic disciplines, which was in the 19th century, so the 1800s, the 19th century, um, people, you know, had categories of knowledge and wanted to categorize the world around them. But the way that knowledge work happened wasn't really the same then as it is now. Um, I mean, you can think of ancient philosophers like Aristotle, who thought about um, poetry and drama and meaning and you know, the physical world uh, and how the cosmos worked. Um, you know, was that someone who was an interdisciplinary scholar? Or is that someone who is... Um, trying to understand the world around them without understanding the boundaries that separate disciplines in the way that we do today. Um, really, before you have academic departments, disciplines don't really work in the same way. Um, you know, you wouldn't uh, get one kind of job as one kind of a philosopher and a different kind of job as a different kind of philosopher. You would just sort of be a philosopher. Um, and the uh, video that I've linked here that I will also post on Course Den for you um, is about the pre-Socratics. So this is sort of, you know, the beginnings of science. Um, and those are really interesting ideas. Uh, we don't necessarily think about where science started. We always think about where it's going and what the future is and what what will happen next um you know but there were um you know from the time civilizations really started to happen um we started to have the development of scientific ideas uh interestingly one of the first places that science really starts to take off um one of the earliest scientists is a man named Thales um, who's covered in that pre-Socratics video, um, a lot of the ancient Greek city-states. And there were a couple of reasons for this. Even though Egypt had a huge civilization at the time when Greece was sort of building its, its reputation, um, a lot of their knowledge was explained by gods very easily. They had, I don't know if you've ever seen that ancient Egyptian iconography where you have bird gods and cat gods and all kinds of stuff. And if something happened, it's probably because the priests said it happened that way. And, you know, and that, that worked for the Egyptians and that worked for how they saw their world. And um, at the same time, if everything already has an answer, it, there's less motivation to 
you know, do academic research in a, in a primitive kind of way. Uh, whereas in Greece, what you had were a lot of smaller city-states with sort of common large uh, open spaces called the Agora. Um, and people would go from town to town and talk about things that they had seen, things that they had experienced. When those things didn't line up, people started to wonder why. You know, well, why do my crops grow this way over, you know, on that side of the mountain versus grow a different way on the other side of the mountain? People are learning about climate. People are learning about soil technology. Um, you know, if there was a really good midwife in one particular town who didn't lose as many babies as the midwife in the next town, people wanted to know why. Um, and, you know, that kind of interpersonal communication and curiosity about other communities helped to generate what would be uh, considered rudimentary scientific practices. Um, there were several kinds of philosophy. Everything was sort of thought of as a philosophy, like the things that we would know. We like knowledge, you know, uh, philo from love and uh, sophistry from knowledge. Um, so, you know, in, in ancient civilizations, there was natural philosophy, which was sort of how the world worked, uh, you know, that natural philosophy was, um, you know, why uh, human bodies were what they were, but also why the cosmos was what it was, um, and, you know, soil and babies and cats and dogs and know what a whale was people were really weirded out by whales at this time you know it was just like a giant sea monster they didn't know that whales just kind of did their own thing um but now we do and you would only see a whole whale if it like died and then it just looked kind of big and terrifying and had this giant mouth that could eat you uh, mechanical philosophy that's sort of where we get to uh ancient rome and Lots of amazing builders and aqueducts and uh, some of the origins of engineering that you find in ancient Rome. Um, you know, mechanics is about motion and movement. And of course, we look at mechanics today as something that um, we see in physics and other kinds of STEM fields as well as engineering. Um, but, you know, certainly it was a very practical and applied field early on. Uh, moral philosophy, we think about ethics, we think about, you know, right and wrong and certain kinds of behavior. Uh, mathematics is also a philosophical, um, abstract idea that people know about. So you think of people like Euclid. Uh, geometry wasn't necessarily called a philosophy, but it would have been grouped together with other kinds of knowledge. And then we have uh, theology. And theology was very, very important to a lot of people, especially in the kind of Christian era after we have ancient civilizations. Then um, a lot of communities where people thought things were people trying to interpret religious texts. Um, often in the Western uh, Christianity flourishing nations. Um, and so you would have monks together kind of, you know, trying to figure out how many angels would fit on the head of a pin or something like that, you know, um, all these really interesting physical and, and philosophical questions. Um, one of the works that kind of helped to uh, introduce modern disciplines um, is from the late 1600s. And uh, one of the things that happened, if you've ever studied the scientific revolution, where we sort of moved as a society from uh, thinking about uh, the Earth as the center of the universe to uh, reading Copernicus and Galileo and Kepler and all those other scientists and, you know, this proof that the sun was at the center of the universe and not the Earth. Um, and one of the sort of final books to offer conclusive proof of that uh, was Newton's Principia, the full name of which was Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica. And what that means is the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. 
from 1687. So what you have is you'll see from these words what kind of comes from this bulleted list before where you have, you know, natural philosophy was as old as time pretty much. Um, and then the idea that the principles of the world can be founded in mathematics, you know, that we can use math to determine what the orbit of a planet that we will never even see in person is. Um, you know, this was an extraordinary accomplishment. And by being able to prove uh, the universality of gravitation and motion that Newton uh, believed in, um, and was able to prove math mathematically, at least for his time, um, you know, that was a way that people could look at a book that someone wrote and say, I want to do this kind of knowledge work. And what we have today is modern physics and modern astronomy kind of comes from that moment, you know, where you have people who take astronomy are often discouraged to realize that it's a lot of math or the physics is a lot about math and motion and, and calculating things and figuring out, um, you know, different rates at different times, which, you know, is also, we talk about calculus, which is another Newton thing. We won't get into that right now, but, um. Yeah, so disciplines sort of start to happen in the 1700s and the 1800s. And, you know, by the time we get to 1900, there are scientists and there are historians and there are all kinds of, you know, separate kinds of people doing different kinds of knowledge work and writing books about it. And there are people to read those books, which is exciting. Um, so, yeah, to kind of uh, sum up, um, you know, in the beginning... People were just figuring things out in a complex world. And disciplines were a response to people developing increasingly specialized knowledge following the 18th century. So, you know, the, the 1800s or so after. Um, that went on for 100 years or so from the 1800s to the 1900s. And now what we have um, in, you know, in the following century uh, we have adherence to disciplinary conventions because those have helped evolve modern universities, but also the questioning of those boundaries through interdisciplinary studies programs like ours. And so here are some slides of older universities. I'd like you to look at the images um, and think about what is most surprising and interesting about them. We have uh, you know, a thousand-year-old university, the University of Bologna in Italy uh, from 1088, what that university looks like. Uh, Bologna again in 1088, you see this right here on the left is a giant uh, cathedral. The University of Paris uh, in 1150, uh, the Sorbonne is also part of that system if you've ever heard of that. Oxford University, that's the only one of uh, these ancient universities here that I've been to. I've also been to Cambridge. Um, you know, a medieval university, you see a lot of different church spires and things like that. Um, so when we talk about how um, people would go to university in preparation to be in the clergy um, or other kinds of you know, more philosophical pursuits. Uh, I mean, there were literally churches everywhere you looked where these people would be um, practicing. So universities weren't always like, here's a science lab. And uh, West Georgia, of course, founded in, in 1906. And you see West Georgia in more recent days, um, you know, lots of different buildings. Often a building will house a particular department um, or, you know, or particular disciplines. Uh, biology has a building. Um, you know, that's where you go to take a bio class or teach a bio class. You know, XIDS is kind of all over, really. And then here we are in the uh, early 1940s, in the very beginning. Uh, and I'd like to conclude by asking you to watch this uh, last crash course on the Islamic Golden Age because not all of our ideas came from those Western universities, um, that as those universities were growing, there were parallel developments that became really important as well. So watch this and link too. Thanks.